So, uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to the uh, TAC meeting for uh, Monday, June 24th. So our uh, first thing is the, the approval of the TAC agenda for today, June 24th. Move to approve. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve the uh, agenda for today. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. All opposed? All right, thank you. Next is the approval of the TAC meeting minutes from uh, May 20th. Hopefully you've had a chance to review the, the minutes. If so, I'd entertain a motion for approval. So moved. Yeah, Allison motion. Smith, second. All right, thank you, Allison. Do we have a motion and a second to approve the uh, TAC meetings from May 20th? Any discussion? All in favor say aye. All aye. opposed? All right, thanks. Uh, next, we have the director of support, Chad. Thank you, thank you uh, Mr. Chair. Good morning, uh, members of the uh, technical advisory committee. We have a few reports to report to you. Um, before that, I want to give an overview of today's agenda. We have no action items today, but good update items. Uh, we have some diligent work done by Wichita State University staff, uh, Center for Economic Development and Business Research. We have Jonathan and Craig here, uh, diving more into methodologies behind forecasting. Forecasting is always a challenging for anything, whether it is traffic or population or economic uh, growth or jobs. So it's, it's uh, you know, the technical presentations is something today is lined up. And also we have regional transit implementation plan update that Bill is going to uh, talk to you as well. Um, um, on the, you know, the initiatives that are in the form of request for proposals, uh, Peter is uh, going to provide an update and, and then a few other items. So Peter, thank you. Good morning, TAC committee. Um, start here with our request for proposals since we had several out and give some updates on those. So as you're all probably well aware, we have the Intelligent Transportation Systems ITS architecture update. We last updated it in 2006 and we are looking for a consultant to help us with this task. And that one is moving along quite well. Uh, the RFP is officially closed. Uh, the consultant selection committee will be performing interviews later this week, and hopefully this will turn into a consent item for TPB here shortly. Uh, travel demand model phase two. Uh, we just had one proposal submitted for the uh, travel demand model phase two update, which is uh, a consultant contract to help with technical support for the model and help us keep it updated and get the most use out of it. Um, that one we currently have sent off for uh, to legal for development of a contract that should hopefully be a consent item at our next TPB meeting. Uh, SRTS, we're seeking a consultant to assist in the development of safe routes to school plans for all schools and school districts in the region. We issued that RFP on the 31st and the deadline for submission is June 24th. So that is today. Um, and then we have the Safe Streets and Roads for All SS4A Implementation Grant application. Um, for that one, we are looking to hire a consultant to help us to make a competitive application for the SS4A Implementation Grant in 2025. And then just to give notice on the last one, we do have a contract in the works for our bike ped counters that should hopefully be, again, another consent item for TPP so that all in all makes a possible three consent items on these different RFPs coming up. Any questions for me? Not seeing anything, so thank you. Thank you, Peter, next item, thank you. So uh, next item is our bi-monthly tip update. So per our page, on page 23 of our WAMPO tip policy, it requires bi-monthly progress reports for projects programmed to receive WAMPO sub-allocated federal funding in the current federal fiscal year, or if they've received it in a past federal fiscal year, but have not yet finished. And this is in your packet on page 11. As always, I'll run down through the ones that are supposed to obligate this year. So we have the Hayesville, Seneca, and 63rd Street bike ped map. 
anticipated let date is February 2024 with anticipated completion in summer of 2024. Our Safe Routes to School Planning Assistance anticipated let date, as we discussed, uh, the RFP closes today, so June 2024 with an anticipated project completion date in December 2025. The Which Way Video Wall uh, let date, anticipated let date in October 2024, the anticipated project completion December 10th, 2024. The Nelson Drive realignment, anticipated let uh, July 2024 with anticipated completion date in December 2025. Oliver and Kichai Road section, anticipated let in July of 24 with the project completion date in spring of 2025. The multimodal facility or MMF, anticipated let date June 21st with a project completion date of uh, December 31st, 2025. And then the West Street I-235 MacArthur project with the anticipated let date of October 2024 and anticipated project completion date and spring of 2026. I normally don't go through the uh, ones from previous years, but I just want to quick mention we had a, uh, an update on the Valley Center Meridian Ford from uh, 77th Street to Seward and the 69th Street. Uh, the anticipated, the project has started construction and the anticipated project completion date is in May of 2025. And in the packet as well, you can see all these different projects mapped across the Wampo region. And then additionally, these are uh, another summary table of the non suballocated federal funds in the WEMPO tip, also <laughs> available in the packet for your review. Don, any questions on the bi monthly tip updates? Do you mind uh, pushing a button on your mic? Thanks. What, pro what, what project? What actually is it doing, the Which Way Video Wall? The Which Way Video Wall, it's a large set of displays that will be in the, uh, it's in a traffic management center. I'd have to go look at the exact location of where that is, but it's, yeah, it's a large set of displays in this center. It's not something out on a roadway, I guess, to, to clarify. But I can send you more information if it Okay. Thank you, Peter. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. I think uh, the next item we have is, you know, we have Vampo had uh, allocated Wichita uh, Area MPO Regional Active Transportation Plan. Uh, before that, we want to keep an eye on how progress of Wichita Master Bike Plan update is going on. So Kim is here to update. Kim. Yes, good morning. Uh, Kim Newfield, Multimodal Transportation Safety Planner. Just wanted to give a quick update on Wichita's Bicycle Master Plan. Um, of course, Wichita staff, feel free uh, to jump in as well. Uh, the plan is, is going well and getting ready to actually uh, wrap up this fall, but the vision of the plan really is to encourage bicycling and provide safe, comfortable, and convenient bike facilities for all people, which is really important because it's looking to reach those uh, younger residents, the older residents, and those who are newer to riding as well to make this really um, a transportation option for, for all people in our community. Um, as you can see, there's quite a few uh, goals and, and projects uh, that are identified in this plan. So it's really exciting to see the bicycle network uh, re-looked at and examined and looked for, you know, they're looking for gaps um, and, and ways to make a more complete, safe network. So really excited to see that. Also, uh, as you can see, infrastructure improvements, uh, bicycle parking improvements is actually included, which is really important if you ride your bicycle somewhere to have a, a space where you can uh, park it safely. Uh, programs and policies, there's actually 42 policies that they're looking at uh, that need to be updated to support this plan. Um, of course, action plan and funding strategies are always important and uh, conceptual bike improvements for several of the priority locations. So we'll actually have some, some plans coming out of this plan that can be acted upon. Uh, as I mentioned, they're looking to wrap this up probably around fall. And then as Chad mentioned, we will pick up with our active transportation plan for the region and looking at connectivity be, um, uh, between the cities. So uh, any questions or Wichita staff, would you like to include any uh, 
or Alan Kaler, I know you're working on it as well. So, okay, well, we're really excited about this plan. So it's gonna be great. Thanks so much, uh -huh. I appreciate it. I think we have a couple of items from Marky on public engagement and then Heartland Flyer. Hi, good morning. Marky Jonas, Administrative and Public Outreach Coordinator. Um, so the first thing I'm gonna mention is you may have heard it before, but we are currently in our third round of public engagement for our Metropolitan Transportation Plan for the year 20, up to, until the year 2050. Um, so we have surveys available online in English, Spanish, and Vietnamese. Please complete the survey if you have not already. We also request if you have any ways to share the link and help us distribute the survey more, that would be great. Um, we have some extra flyers for those of you in person up here in the front, as well as some cool Wampo keychains. So please feel free to grab one of those. Any questions, comments? Okay. The next thing I was gonna mention is that in December of 2023, the Federal Railroad Administration selected the Heartland Flyer extension between Oklahoma City and Newton, so through Wichita, um, as a foot future excuse me, as a possible future inner city passenger rail route in the corridor identification and development program. Um, and it's worth noting that just getting this corridor ID was really a great, huge first step. KDOT is anticipated to complete a service development plan this month, and the KDOT Ike program and federal matching funds could pay for the planning and construction of the program, um, but legislative action would be required to pay for the operation of the Heartland Flyer extension. And then depending on funding, it is expected to be operational in 2029. And then there's a map of where the extension would be. Any questions? Thank you, Mark, I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, just want to share, uh, you know, the difference between uh, what is corridor ID program that Marky just mentioned and what is uh, Amtrak long distance uh, study. I had placed some handouts uh, uh, in near you and then also some at the end of the table. Um, these handouts, uh, it has the difference between uh, you know, the difference between what is corridor ID program and what is Amtrak long distance service. There are many uh, elements to it, but on an, you know, on a bigger picture, I just want to share with you that anything greater than 750 miles is included in the long distance service study. And anything less than 70, 750 miles has a corridor ID program based on federal Railroad Administration, and there are some other differences that are, you know, uh, more detailed in this handout, and they are there just for your information. And as study progresses, uh, staff will keep you updated on the progress of that. So that's all we have on the director's report. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, uh, thank you, Chad and, uh, and staff for uh, for all your presentations. Uh, it's great to get updates. All right, next we have uh, public comments. So. Um, this is the forum for the public to uh, speak about anything on the agenda or anything off the agenda. Is there any uh, member of the public would like to speak? All right, not seeing anybody. We'll move on to uh, the action item, which there are no action items today. Uh, next, we have item five, discussion and updates. First, we have the uh, fiscal year 25 through 28 tip public comment period. Uh, Peter? Good morning again. I don't have a whole lot to say here, but we felt we should make this an update item because it is something that's quite important. We do every two years. So on our website right now, and you can see here on the screen, our draft 2025 to 2028 tip is available for review. Um, the public comment period will run from June or is running, uh, started on June 12th and will close on July 11th. Um, the next steps is we'll offer this for TAC recommendation on July 22nd and uh, tentative TPB approval on August 13th. And as stated on the screen, this does include all of the project selection committee's recommendations approved on by TPB this uh, past June 11th. Um, but yes, uh, please at your leisure, visit our website, leave a comment, 
take a look. All right, thank you, Peter. Any questions for Peter? All right, well, uh, thank you. All right, next one, we will move on to the uh, regional uh, transient implement, uh, implementation plan update. Uh, we have Bill here today. Uh, oh, yes. Good morning. Um, can I get uh, access? Oh, okay. We'll go that way then. Um, I can you can you share the screen or can I share my screen? Bill, are you wanting to share your screen instead of using the slides that you had sent us? Um, yeah, because I really can't see what you're you're showing. Oh, okay. Yeah, I still can't see it. Or are you giving me the ability to share? You should oh. be able to share your screen now. Okay, sorry. Okay, can you see my screen? Uh, yes, can Good. the people online see uh, the screen as well? Okay. Yeah, yes, you're good. Cool. Monday morning glitch is out of the way. Okay, what, what I wanted to just spend a little bit of time on uh, this morning is giving you some progress as to where we're at um, in um, completing the regional transit Im implementation plan. Um, I think the one of the big takeaways that I want to get from today is that we are going out and requesting from each of the member jurisdictions some input on the the more detailed alternatives that we have been uh, developing that we have been talking about as part of the public engagement process um, and anything that that you folks can do in, in discussing uh, the range of projects with uh, decision makers, leaders from each of your communities or your agencies um, will be very much appreciated. Um, so where are we at? Um, you know, that, that there is essentially these three phases in the overall project. And we are in the process now of developing the more detailed plans of actions that may um, occur, may take place in the future to improve the level of, of accessibility to communities um, outside of Wichita, but providing additional or improved access between those communities in Wichita, those communities and each other. But I think of one of the other big elements is is looking at alternatives that provide additional connectivity within each of the communities. And that's kind of that stage that we're in now is we've provided information on potential ridership of a number of different alternatives, the cost of a number of different alternatives, um, and, and some of the kind of just the pros and the cons of different alternatives um, for addressing uh, service needs within the area. That, that those service needs or those concepts um, cover the range of ideas that are shown here at a very high level. And essentially out of each of these service types, we have developed a more detailed conversation about um, how or where a particular alternative may be applicable um, within the region. And that's the questionnaire that we are going to be getting out very soon here to, <clears throat> excuse me, the uh, decision makers within each of the communities to get an understanding of, of, okay, here is an alternative that we are talking about. What is your level of support or not of a particular alternative? And we can get into a little bit more of a conversation about that. Um, but as we're looking at the alternatives that we essentially have grouped alternatives and ideas for improved transit service within the area into three concepts. Uh, first of that concept is identifying more and new opportunities uh, for people to get to, to and from work that is in Wichita. So that would be uh, people that would be coming from some of the outlying communities with the destination of Wichita with the idea that, that if you're coming to Wichita, 
that there would also be service that would go back to a particular community so that either in, in reality, we also would support the reverse commute for these, these uh, alternatives. The, the next theme is providing more opportunities for regional travel and particularly to and from and within those communities that are outside of Wichita that today have a relatively limited amount of transportation service um, where uh, Sedgwick County Transportation provides connectivity between communities. There are only a couple of communities within the Wampo area that have intra-community service and that this alternative or this theme would, would include additional alternatives for uh, supporting that, that need. And then the last theme that we have is, is alternatives that would support um, the employment growth and in future employment growth opportunities that are occurring outside of the Wichita area or that suburban and exurban area of, of the metropolitan area. So within these themes that the table over here is showing the range of more detailed alternatives that we have been developing, we have been evaluating, we have been um, taking to public information meetings to have conversations with people about them. And that what we've identified in this table here is that, that these more detailed alternatives that are listed here um, and that how they support each of the particular themes um, that we have developed um, for the service. And that for each of the, or each of the particular alternatives that we've added here, that we, we have developed what we're calling is our, our one pager. And what these are is a more detailed description of each of the alternatives. And the example that I'm showing here is the um, express route concepts that we have identified that would connect Derby to Wichita, would connect Bel Air to Wichita, would connect Goddard and uh, Garden Plain to Wichita, connect Andover better to Wichita. And for each of these, we have a description of what that concept might be. Um, we're including a lot of our, our key assumptions that we use to either develop ridership, develop costs, um, how it may be funded, um, as in who, which, which community or which agency may have that funding responsibility, because those services that we would be providing outside of Wichita that would even connect to Wichita, we're making the assumption that those outlying communities or the county um, would, would have the responsibility for the local element of cost um, and then those are the conversations that we are having at this point. And that each of these one pagers can be accessed through the, the, um, the URL that's listed here on essentially the WAMPO website. Or if you're using your phone, you can also access it through the QR code. But then for each of those, there is a little bit more detail um, that, and, and we believe enough detail to at least have that that conversation at the local level to understand whether or not a municipality or an agency may be um, may support a particular alternative may think nope it's really not for us and and if they do support it we're also putting out a questionnaire to to ask the question of would you support it as operator or would you support it as a partner but not be the operator community associated with that particular alternative. Um, one of the things that we have made sure that we are pointing out as we continue through in getting down into the detail and, 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 and having those conversations about who might be the operator, we want to make sure that we are having a conversation about how the local element of a project would be funded. And what the because the the way that transit improvements or transit service within the area is funded is there is a share that that comes from the federal government through the federal transit administration. There's a portion that would come through the state. There is a portion that is local, and there are also fares associated with that are then collected for each of the rides that are provided. Um, what this pie chart is showing is that this is the historical distribution of, of funding responsibility for the Derby Dash service, which is essentially that 
intra derby um, transit service. And, and you can see here is that um, where where I had talked about the four different funding sources, at, historically, there's only been three um, that Derby is presently working on getting into the, the KDOT funding uh, process. But right now that, you know, uh, over 50% of that service is funded locally and that these are conversations that we want to have with the localities so that they do understand that there is the need to have some skin in the game um, from a funding standpoint. But then over the course of time, and then this is the, the funding pie chart for Sedgwick County Transportation, that over the course of time, there are then opportunities to um, expand the partners that you have within that, that particular service. And here, when we're looking at from a, a local standpoint, that, that in reality with Sedgwick County Transportation, which is the uh, rural transit service, that about 30, um, about 27%, sorry, of that service, which is the combination of the 23 and the 4% over here, that only about 27% of that service is funded locally. So that that is, is one of those key elements that we want to make sure that we point out is, is that there is local responsibility, but there are also a considerable number of partners uh, that we have to help fund transportation service within the area. Um, and where we're moving to now in the study is understanding also that we, we have to be able to identify, well, who is going to be the operator? That it could be a situation that as we're talking to each of the municipalities, that there could be a series of independent operators across the county or across the, I'm sorry, across the, the MPO area in that, um, so, but then each of those operators then um, would be responsible for each of the items that we're including in the little in the little diagram here on the right, which when you think about, well, if we were to have another 10 or another 15 um, smaller operators within the region, each of them doing um, all of the elements identified here, which are required to provide transit service within a region, that might get to be a little bit inefficient within the area. So we want to make sure that we're having the conversation of are there benefits to uh, various jurisdictions, various agencies getting together and coordinating the service that's provided maybe between two communities or three communities uh, within the WAMPO area. And those conversations that we will continue to have as we move forward is that as we're looking at alternatives all the way from independent operators to possibly even one agency providing that service throughout the entire WAMPO area, the, the, the two key things that we want to make sure we're, we're having conversations about is the level of local control and the cost effectiveness. That as we're, if we're over at the left-hand side here, that if we're most concerned about having local control provide the kind of service that we as a municipality want to provide, um, that that kind of leans towards the left side there, of those independent operators of, of service. But at the same time is that then, you know, as I showed in the diagram here, is that if we have each of the operators doing all of these different things, our cost effectiveness of that service regionally is going to be lower. And as we continue to move over to the right, where we may lose a little bit of local control of being able to provide service, the exact service that we as a particular municipality may want to, that that level of control uh, is reduced, but at the same time, our cost effectiveness of that service increases as we share in a lot of those, those maybe more fixed cost alternative or ideas and elements that there are in providing service. So this is the portion of the study that we are, are moving into now, which is kind of that that last new element for conversation. So the remainder here is essentially having conversations about um, each of the alternatives and which of the municipalities have interest in uh, being either an operator of that CERT or well, A, do you believe that you, you um, 
are, are interested in being a supporter of additional service within your community? Are you interested in being an operator or are you interested in being a partner with other agencies that there may be? So with that, I will um, ask for any questions that you may have. So Bill, are you going out to the different uh, municipalities and asking them um, or getting their feedback? Yeah, that, that right now we are um, just kind of wrapping up a, a uh, questionnaire that we will be sending out to each of the, the stakeholders that we have um, as part of the study, but then we're also augmenting that list to make sure that each of the, the municipalities within the WAMPO area um, are, are also included in the questionnaire. So we're, we're doing it a little bit more of a digital means at the beginning here and hoping that we get um, a good amount of participation that way. And that I, I think that if we're not getting participation, we'll have to have another conversation of, well, do we need to uh, be a little bit more personable or, or in-person with that, that conversation? So I think we're first hoping that through a, a digital questionnaire um, with some support information that we can we can get a good amount of, of feedback on that. And I'll, I mean, I'll also ask you guys, you know, based on your experience, are we going to be successful with that? Or are you kind of maybe a little bit questionable at, at, at that approach? I think it all depends on who it uh, gets sent to. It, uh, yeah. Of yep. course, you'd have to, uh, you know, follow up, you know, if, uh, if they aren't yep. responding. Yeah, and uh, we'll do a, Yep. And then that's that balance of, okay, how much, how much uh, follow-up do you do with either an email or a phone call relative to uh, offering an in-person meeting and those kinds of things so that, that we do have a, a bit of a plan on that. So when do you uh, expect that to go out? Um, I'll have Kim, Dora, Markey, do you think it's within, a, we're probably within a day or so, right? Marky, please feel free to chime in. Yeah, um, probably today or tomorrow. Yeah, we're pretty much done just putting on final instructions and clarifying exactly what we're asking for. Right, thank you. Anybody else have any uh, questions for, for Bill? Well, I'm not seeing anything. Uh, okay. I appreciate it. Okay, thank you. And, uh, you know, I do see the, uh, the link here on the uh, interface. So if anybody wants to, uh, you know, check it out, you know. Go check it out. Please. All right. So uh, next we have the population projections. We have uh, Jonathan Norris from uh, CEDBR. Welcome. Thank you. So I'm Jonathan Norris. I'm with uh, Wichita State University Center for Economic Development and Business Research. A lot of you have, have spoken to either in person or you've seen me present online. So a bit of context here. Uh, CEDBR is doing the population forecast model for WAMPO. Um, and uh, we previously presented at the TAC and TPB meetings over the last few months on our intermediate stage in the forecast where we had uh, integrated two of the three components of our migration coefficients to try and get closer and closer to uh, realistic projection targets for the population out to 2050. So uh, we've hit our third stage for almost every community. We're going to take a quick look at uh, the updates to the population model and uh, answer any questions uh, and see, uh, and then take a look at where we're going to go from here with that. So uh, first of all, uh, as the background, uh, so CEDBR uh, is using now a, a age cohort survival model to actually age the existing population up through. Um, uh, this is to address some of the concerns that were uh, based on our original allocation method of our county level forecast down to communities. Um, and so um, we're actually getting a lot closer and closer to the targets that a lot of communities have. Uh, but there is a regional constraint uh, that's meaning that in some of those communities, it's going to be lower uh, than some of the previously existing projections. Uh, and within that, it's important to recognize that the reason for doing all of this in a consistent manner is so that there is um, essentially a fair method, a single fair method of creating forecasts, because a lot of the community level forecasts that were produced previously were done via different teams and using different methodologies. 
Um, so uh, as a, uh, a quick recap of what the development that we have just made between the previous TAC meeting and now is, uh, is been the development of this migration estimate, right? Um, the, so the migration estimate uh, takes into account three factors. So you have uh, the historical migration, which uh, we're calling our community net migration trend. We have our employment forecast that CEDBR has already produced. And now uh, we have our building permits. Uh, so uh, the importance of building permits is to really in, uh, indicate where, uh, wh which communities have been making the significant investments in their housing stock, in their apartments, to try and draw in uh, like new migration and uh, like uh, open up those new households. Each of these factors are weighted according to uh, those uh, percentages you see under each indicator. Uh, and we're going to look at, uh, so uh, we're, we're gonna look first at what those employment forecasts are, which are the same as previously. Um, uh, and this has already kind of been agreed upon and this uh, seems fairly optimistic actually for the region going forward. So this is one component. Um, so changes from our previous uh, estimate without the building permits. In that left table, the population forecast, you'll actually see the counts for each of those uh, uh, target years uh, for the population. And in the table on the right, you'll see what the difference is between uh, this model, including building permits, and the previous model that did not include building permits to show you the degree of difference that that can make. In, in certain cases, more than 5,000 uh, additional people in uh, both Bel Air and in Mays uh, and, and for more almost 5,000 in Andover. So you can see that the building permits data really does make a significant difference in attracting that population. And that brings us a whole lot closer uh, to what some of those uh, original community level estimates were. Um, uh, it, it's important to recognize at this stage that there is this regional, uh, this overall regional restriction taking effect, which is why it's not. Um, uh, quite to the level of some of those. There exists, in essence, what we feel is like a carrying capacity for how many people the total region that WAMPO serves uh, can take in. Um, and uh, trying to grow beyond a certain point, what's going to happen in, in such an interconnected metro is that some of the communities are essentially going to be stealing growth or potential in migrants to, uh, from some of the other communities. Uh, we're already at, or uh, truthfully, slightly above what, uh, what we feel is uh, the, the most uh, correct number for the regional growth, but we're comfortable with the level that it's at right here. Um, uh, and here's where those growth rates lie for each of the communities. Uh, again, I really want to highlight the difference um, between those two um, bar charts on the lower right. With the permits in, let's say, Goddard, for example, you have 158% growth from 2020 to 2050, as opposed to without the building permits data, it was sitting at about 35% growth. So uh, it's really, really uh, influential to recognize where this building is occurring. And uh, so hopefully this uh, it, it increases uh, some of the, uh, the, the realism uh, with which these are made. Um, uh, again, we're seeing some of the same trends where those larger communities are tending to see uh, larger growth, but it's really where those communities are making investments in housing that are creating opportunities for people to move into them more than, more than others. The migration estimates uh, based on this new data are as such, uh, I, I don't really have anything specific to note here other than um, uh, some of those are more optimistic. They're still within the ballpark, how many people are moving into these communities via migration. Um, uh, and uh, to go over where we go from here, the table you see on the right is which communities we've received building permits data from. Uh, for communities that we don't yet have building permits data from, uh, we do not have the 20% weighting on the building permits data. We still use the 80-20 uh, on the other components. Um, uh, but with us being pretty close to uh, full completion of all these communities, we're still pretty confident. And between now and July 8th, we're trying to get the, re the remaining balance of the data. And we have uh, opportunities to schedule meetings with representatives of communities that have questions and uh, or want to provide more information. 
uh, either about their communities or asking us about our methodology uh, to increase that confidence or, you know, raise, you know, questions or uh, provide feedback on that. So if you have, you know, any kind of detailed questions or need for a discussion, I encourage you to schedule that with us. Um, July 9th is the TPB meeting where we'll present the same data. Um, and uh, on July 22nd is when we get to our uh, formal recommendation for the TAC model. Uh, and so by that point, we'll have hopefully met with everybody who has questions. We'll be at full data and we have a lot of optimism. Questions? Uh, do you also include uh, projected building permits, you know, if uh, areas are being developed? So we've met with a few communities already and in communities where they thought that that was actually going to be a factor, yes. Um, uh, not every community has a significant change between what they're like looking back five years, 10 years in their building permits and looking at five years, 10 years forward, you know, in communities where there is a big difference uh, in the way that they're looking for. Yeah, we, we have worked with them on that. And if any other communities have that, we do encourage them to present that data because we, we do want to take that into account as well. Thank you. Are there any questions for Jonathan? I'm not seeing anything. Great. So, uh, I appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Next, we have other business. Uh, no other business to be uh, handled today. And uh, last item is German. Move to adjourn. We have a motion and second. A second. All right. All in favor say aye. 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 Well, we'll see you uh, next month. Thank you.